Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people and about spiritually related topics. Um, we've done over 600 of them now, and if this is new, <clears throat> new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, uh, go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, <clears throat> there's a PayPal button on every page of the website. And there's also a page explaining some alternatives to PayPal. <clears throat> My guest today is Julie Beischel, Ph.D. Julie is the co-founder and director of research at the Windbridge in Research Center. She, she received her Ph.D. in pharmacology and toxicology <clears throat> with a minor in microbiology and immunology. And we're not going to be talking about any of those things today uh, <laughs> because, <laughs> what were you going to say, Julie? I said, oh, no, that's all I prepared to talk about. <laughs> well, tough. We're going, to, <laughs> we're going to talk about spelunking. Um, <clears throat> no, actually, her current research mainly focuses on mediums, individuals who experience communication with the deceased. Uh, Dr. Beischel has published research examining mediums' accuracy and their experiences, psychology and physiology, and the potential therapeutic application of mediumship readings <clears throat> during bereavement. Her research interests also include spontaneous, facilitated, assisted, and requested after-death communication experiences. She lives in Arizona with her husband and research partner, Mark Bocuzzi, and their two dogs. Um, and the reason that we covered this kind of topic on BatGap, and last week I interviewed um, Jim Tucker about reincarnation, and I, I've <clears throat> interviewed people on out-of-body experiences and you know various related things, is that I feel that that's part of the topography of the universe. So there, you know, that we don't live in a strictly materialistic universe, and when the body dies, that's not the end of us. And even though it might be not be directly germane to the um, topic of enlightenment and self-realization and all, it is part of the picture, and all the religious or spiritual traditions of the world have discussed it, and so I feel like we should discuss it. <clears throat> and it's not something that I don't that I think people necessarily have to believe in, but there's actually a lot more reason to take it seriously than many people may realize, <clears throat> because the topic, especially the topic of mediumship, is often treated sort of facetiously. Um, I I actually interviewed Bruce Joel Rubin, who won the Oscar for the movie Ghost, in which. Patrick Swayze sang I'm Henry the Eighth I Am over and over again to Whoopi Goldberg, who was playing a medium, until she agreed to cooperate with him and you know, let him communicate through her. Um, in any case, um, it's a serious topic, and Julie Beischel has been taking it very seriously for, what, like 15 years now studying it? <clears throat> yeah, I was introduced to the topic around 20 years ago, and I've been mm -hmm. doing research for at least 15, yeah. Yeah. Um, and there are some, I, just, I thought I'd start with a few nice quotes that I picked up from your books that I read. Um, here's one from a th Tibetan Buddhist uh, tradition. They say, when you're born, you cry and the world rejoices. When you die, you rejoice and the world cries. <laughs> here's one from William James. I believe there is no source of deception in the investigation of nature which can compare with a fixed belief that certain kinds of phenomena are impossible. Here's one from Lao Tzu. What the caterpillar calls the end, the rest of the world calls a butterfly. And here's one from Rabindranath Tagore. Death is not extinguishing the light, it is putting out the lamp because the dawn has come. So those are nice. Um, so how did you go, Julie, from kind of a, you know, the study that I just uh, described, toxicology and pharmacology and all that, uh, to getting interested in this topic, making it your career, really? Um, the short answer is, while I was in grad school, I suffered a personal loss. My mom died from suicide. And so my family is remarkably Catholic. And so I had this idea. I'd been, you know, I'd heard about this place called heaven, but it was very... Uh, not concrete at all. 
And so I, I never heard of psychic abilities or mediums or anything. And then I, it was at the time that John Edward was on that show Crossing Over. And yeah, I saw that. Yeah, used to watch him. Yeah. And I thought, well, those people look genuinely moved by what he's saying. And it seems pretty specific. But I would, I'm a scientist. I've always been a scientist. I would have to check that out for myself. So I got a recommendation for a local medium. And I went and it was very evidential. And I, I had read a little bit about how fraudulent mediums can um, fool you. And so I was on the lookout for those kind of things and none of them happened. And uh, I got this reading and it was really um, profound of like, wait, I just talked to my deceased mother. Like, you know, it was just weird. And as a scientist, I wanted to learn more and more. And there um, hadn't been anything done in a long time, really. And I, so I was like, well, I think I think I should look into it. And the universe was like kick in the pants, like, here you go. That's what you're going to do with your life now. And all these pieces just fell into place. And in 2008, uh, Mark and I founded the Winbridge Institute. And then in 2017, we moved all that life after death mediumship research to the new Winbridge Research Center, which is a 501c3 charity. Great. <clears throat> so people can donate to it if they want to help support it. That would be great. <clears throat> yeah. Incidentally, I have a, a friend who lives there in northern Arizona named George. Hi, George. Who um, happens to be Harry Houdini's great nephew. Oh. And, and I mentioned that because Houdini was really interested in this topic and really tried hard, I think, to find some credible evidence of it. And I'm not quite sure he ever succeeded. It seems to me that evidence of the continuation of life after death, whether through, you know, mediumship or out-of-body experiences, near-death experience kind of reports and all, could have a major impact on people's psychology and how they actually view life itself, it, um, not only how they might view death, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Fe fear of death is re so um, insipid. Like, we don't even know how scared of death we are as individuals. And so you don't really know how it's affecting your decision-making ability and, like, what what it's impacting like there's a theory called terror management theory where the theory is uh because of your fear of death you know you're gonna die so you do not want your worldview to die and then you try and Im and impose it on others so when people are reminded of their own death they're even more adamant about trying to push their own worldviews on others and if you're reminded that like hey maybe there's an afterlife and you'll live on they're they don't have that tendency so there and there are all kinds of examples of that how the fear of death can impact um our just moving through the world so it does have an impact like whether you um, believe that it's important in your life because you don't know anyone that has died like it is important in your life because of these issues about fear of death. That's very interesting. I've often felt that the tendency to be fundamentalist and you know adamant about one's perspective had an underlying fear uh, you know either a fear or, or either a doubt in one's own um, belief you know, and you're trying to buttress up the belief by pounding it into others, um, or something like that. So anyway, what you said I found very interesting. There's a section in one of the papers you sent me um, where you have a conversation at Thanksgiving or something with a hypothetical <laughs> Uncle Harold. Um, right. <laughs> so I thought I'd start maybe by um, bringing up some of Uncle Harold's um, skeptical questions and see okay. how you would answer them. Um, so. The first one is, there's no way science can study something like mediumship. Okay, so uh, science is not a body of knowledge. It is a set of tools for answering questions. So it is a set of steps, make an observation, make a hypothesis, test the blah, blah, blah. It's a bunch of steps. So whatever the, f if you can observe it, you can use science to investigate it. So we can look around in the world, there are humans providing readings to other humans and the content of the reading is specific it's about a deceased person and so now there's all kinds of questions that we can ask about about that phenomenon but of course science can investigate this and i've been doing so for nearly 20 years so yeah and um 
this is not Uncle Harold's question, this is mine, but okay. um, when you test a medium and various information comes through, I presume that some of it is objectively verifiable, like the medium might you know, say, well, so-and-so is saying that, you know, I don't know, there's a grandfather clock in her home and it, it broke and it's set to three o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. Uh, and you can give me a better example. And so, in other words, it's not just a matter of subjective opinion or belief or things that can't be verified. That's correct. So when we bring it into the lab and study it at the Winbridge Research Center, what we do is a twofold approach. So we have optimal environment for the medium and the sitter and the deceased. And because you can't like put them under water and go, well, they didn't do a reading, so it's all fraud. Like you have to do it, you have to mimic the natural environment as close as possible. That's one piece. And then the second piece is optimal controls. So you have to eliminate as much as you can the, the other explanations for what it could be. So we can't let the medium have any access to the sitter to where they can Google them or look things up. So, or where they so the just... sitter the sitter is, is oh. a, a, a living person who wants to contact their mother or something like that. And that's, that, that's what the sitter means. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. For, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of terminology in this. Yeah. The sitter is the living person who wants to receive messages. And then we call the deceased person the discarnate. I'll try and not use that word, but if I use it, that's referencing that's the mean. deceased person. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in our protocol, which we have nicknamed it's quintuple blind. There's five levels of blinding. Mm -hmm. The medium, this gets really complicated and I have talked about this. I've written about this elsewhere and there are um, free fact sheets and other videos and things on our website at winbridge.org where I go through all of these details. But essentially we control for all those things. The medium doesn't have access to the sitter. I serve as a proxy sitter in place of the absent sitter. And I ask the medium specific questions about the discarnate. So it can, they can't just say, your father loves you. <laughs> Five stars. Right? <laughs> like we're asking, um, we ask about the uh, physical description, the personality, hobbies or activities, and cause of death. And then if the, if the discarnate has any specific messages for the sitter. So, and then that information is transcribed and scored and the sitter receives two readings, one is theirs and one is what's called a decoy and they don't know which is which. So that controls for a psychological phenomenon called reader bias, where maybe you're gonna give the medium the benefit of the doubt because of your personality type and you're gonna score everything. Or maybe you're very skeptical like Uncle Harold and you're gonna score everything is wrong. So it evens out the reader bias across the study. Hmm. Um, and so we did that 58 times with 20 pre-screened mediums and it did show that the, at least these mediums can report accurate and specific information about the deceased under blinded controlled laboratory conditions. Mm. Maybe as we go along you'll give us some specific examples of that. Um, and and I, I understand that you have a fairly rigorous screening process or testing process for these mediums before they can work with you? Yes, we have a, an eight-step uh, screening and certification procedure. So the mediums, they're interviewed, they perform test readings to say, can you really do, um, under controlled laboratory conditions, can you do what you're saying that you're doing in your regular practice? Um, they, they're trained on uh, human subjects research protocols, on the history of mediumship research, on uh, a little bit on grief and bereavement. And then, so it takes months and months to complete the, its eight steps. And at the end, the medium is certified as a Winbridge certified research medium, but it's very time and resource intensive. So we receive a grant to be able to collect our current team that we have. And we, then we were, we needed to close the screening. So we're not screening any mediums anymore. Okay. I'll just ask Uncle Harold's second question since I can't remember what I was going to ask. Um, his second question was, but all mediums are frauds and con artists taking advantage of the bereaved, which is what Whoopi Goldberg was doing in, in the movie Ghost, you know, until Patrick Swayze came along. Right. I think in that case of that movie, she was a real medium, but it's, it, maybe it's not easy to do. Like we've 
put together this team of 20, two have retired, there's now 18, um, and they can do it on demand, but maybe not everybody can. And so if you're, if you have to make a living at it and you're forced to do it on demand every day, like maybe sometimes you fake it, right? Like in the case of that movie, mm -hmm. but that we can disprove the the idea that all mediums are con artists by saying, I brought these 20 in the lab. I blinded the heck out of the protocol. There was no way they were committing fraud. They had no information and they still were able to provide accurate information. So hypothesis disproven, Uncle Harold. Yeah, actually, I remember my other question, which was that um, a lot of these mediums are professionals at it. Um, do they have like a Winbridge good housekeeping seal of approval thing that they can put on their websites once you've tested them and they work with you? Yes, they do. They volunteer their time. Uh, no money changes hands. So we don't pay them. They don't pay us. But we do um, as a service to the public. We have that list available on our website in case people want to um, uh, go to a medium that's been vetted by a scientist. They can uh, pick from that list. Um, and we want to reward the meeting like they're not they're volunteering their time they volunteer their time to research and um and we want to reward them we want to give something back so yeah they have they have badges for their websites that say winbridge certified research medium cool irene and i had a reading from a reading a medium one time and she's somebody we know quite well i don't want to name her um but it uh, it didn't pan out. It's like she got stuck. Like maybe we had our psychic shields up or something. So, and you know, it didn't cause me to doubt her ability because I've seen you know ample evidence of it elsewhere. Um, but somehow she just hit a wall with us. It's a really important point. So uh -huh. a mediumship reading involves three people, right? The medium is just one. There's also the sitter and the deceased person. So if the deceased person, we don't know how it works exactly. Maybe they haven't learned how to do it yet. Maybe they don't like this particular medium. Maybe they don't think you're ready to hear from them. There's all kinds of things out of our control. Yeah, the sitter, if the sitter is really skeptical, that can, you know, if, if you were, uh, if I died and then you were at a medium and you were like, I don't believe any of this. Like, why would I come and talk to you? <laughs> right. right. Um, if you were, if you were a skeptic. So there's the, all three of those people have to be at their best on that day. So that like, there are people that we attempted to certify and didn't, didn't pass the certification that day. And we're really quick to say they didn't achieve passing scores with that discarnate on that day with that sitter whether they are, so we can never say they're not a good medium overall, or they are a good medium. I can't, I can't uh, say that the mediums on our team are going to be good every day with every sitter, because that's, again, it's three people, and people are people, and they all don't get along. Yeah, well, Babe Ruth didn't hit home runs every time. Um, right. In our case, I think we were open-minded about it, but, you know, we were trying to contact our mothers and stuff, and who knows, this was years after our mothers had died. Maybe they had moved on to some other level, or realm or something, and just weren't around to connect with. Our data has shown that uh, it, it can be decades later that it is possible, that that's not, like, that's not a thing people have to worry about. Oh, they, that that is definitely something that happens. The person is no longer available. That's not what we've seen in the research. Okay, good. Um, here's another question from Uncle Harold. There's, and you've already kind of covered this, but maybe you can embellish it a bit. There's no good evidence for mediumship or psychic abilities. Well, there's plenty of evidence for psychic abilities. So um, just a couple years ago, uh, there's a a university in Sweden called Lund University and a psychology professor there, Etzel Cardinia, did a, a review of over 125 published papers and meta-analyses and concluded that, yeah, th there's ample evidence that psychic functioning is real. And that replicated what University of California statistician Jessica Utz had published in 1995 saying the same thing. And her study was um, in I, won't, I don't know if it was funded, but definitely encouraged by uh, the CIA and Congress. 
And so those were her findings that she reported. And in her paper, she said, this is a done deal. Like, this is so obviously real. We can stop studying it. We can stop trying to prove it. And we didn't. That was 1995. And we keep doing it. We keep trying to show that it's real. Um, and it is. That, that the consciousness can access information across space and time. That has been repeatedly demonstrated in the laboratory. And then the what mediumship is, is a kind of psi, right? They're using telepathy, they're using mind-to-mind -mind communication to communicate with the deceased. So it's a type of psi. It's interesting that the body of human knowledge, that even human scientific knowledge is so siloed, you know, so segmented. I've interviewed Dean Radin a couple of times and others at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and others in this kind of genre. And, you know, they, they all say, well, you know, so it's just so many scientists, perhaps the majority of them, who just even won't even look at our research because they, they just say, well, couldn't be possible, therefore I'm, gonna, I'm not going to waste my time. <laughs> it's kind of this closed-mindedness. Um, anyway, any comments on that? Well, it's like the, it's the world and science have a long history of that sort of thing happening, of paradigms being really difficult to overthrow, right? The, the Earth is the center of the universe. The sun is revolving around the Earth. Like, that took forever for people to really look at the data and go, that, no, that's not how these bodies are moving through space. So it's no, it's no wonder this is going to take a bit of, you know, the, the joke is like paradigms fall one funeral at a time. Right, you have to just wait for all the people to die off who are the staunch um, supporters of these these um, theories that don't have the data behind them. Yeah, I think I talked about this with uh, Jim Tucker last week. Where there's a word for it, I forget the word, but it's that it's kind of the um, the stability of paradigms. They they can't. It's good in a sense that they can't just be sort of overturned with the slightest bit of an, an anomaly. Um, but on the other hand, they often seem too uh, stubborn, you know, too rigid, and it really takes a, a certain critical mass of contradictory evidence before they finally give way. Definitely. Yeah, it's so unscientific to say, well, this can't be real, so I'm not even going to look at the data. Like, that's so the opposite of science. And anyone who calls themselves a scientist and then says something like that, they're not a good scientist. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just say that. That's why David Lorimer and others started the Galileo Commission, because Galileo's contemporaries in the church said exactly that thing. They said, well, you know, Jupiter couldn't have moons or whatever you say is, is out there because it contradicts church doctrine. Therefore, we're not going to look through your telescope. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, the, uh, you know, this data that I collected, 58 readings, 20 mediums, that was published in 2015 in a peer reviewed journal, like it's out there um, and it's it's real. So let's move on as a society and go, okay, how can we use this to be better people, to um, treat bereavement, um, to, to alleviate fear of death so that we're not, again, one of the things is trying to push our belief systems on others. Yeah, I think one of the reasons this spooks mainstream scientists so much is, firstly, I mean, they would be ridiculed if they actually showed interest in mediumship or something like that. Many of them or fear that they would be. But also, you know, the materialist, physicalist paradigm is really the predominant paradigm. And, and this kind of thing challenges that. And so what we're really asking them to do is completely restructure their worldview, you know, from the bottom up. And you can't blame them for not just saying, okay, I'll do that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's the idea that, you know, if people are studying neurology and the brain and we're going, ah, oh, it's really not that important. Consciousness is separate from that and it, it's primary. Then it sort of discounts their life's work. Of course, you would be hesitant to jump on board with that. And then the other piece is there's no funding for this kind of research, essentially. And scientists are people and like to eat and sleep indoors. So, of course, <laughs> they're going to stick with the things that can get funding. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you know, the widespread acceptance that consciousness is fundamental and, you know, is not merely created by the brain would not put neurophysiologists out of business because it would open up a whole new 
arena for study. I mean, how is it that the brain is a transmitter receiver for consciousness? You know, how does that work? And where are memories right. stored and all kinds of things like that? Yeah, you're right. It doesn't, it doesn't put an end to their life's work. It opens up a bunch of new avenues. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'd say they're, they're going down a dead end if they're spending all their time just trying to figure out how the brain creates consciousness. It's a, it's a, wrong, yes. a wrong hypothesis to begin with. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's so much data that support all of the, the, um, the psi, the psychic phenomena data support. If, if consciousness can acquire information across space and time, then it can't be stuck inside the skull. So there's all that. And then there's all kinds of evidence of like, uh, memory is not stored in the brain. If it was, then when people had strokes, localized strokes, they would lose specific kinds of memories. And that's not how it works. So there's all this mainstream evidence that consciousness is not created by the brain. Clearly, there's a relationship between the two. But it's, it's, yeah, it's, like you said, it's, the, I think the better explanation is that the brain is the receiver of this external, um, non-local consciousness that's primary. Yeah, like a radio. That's this is such a, it's a helpful metaphor, you know. The radio yeah. doesn't create the music, and if the radio breaks, the music doesn't cease. Another radio could pick it up, but, you know, it's a transmitter-receiver kind of a thing, depending on the kind of radio. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Irene has a question. Um, have you tested many that have highly developed abilities? For instance, there are a couple of well-known mediums that, it would appear, are extremely accurate most of the time, at least the ones you see on television. You don't know how much is being edited out. But do you find a big range in abilities? Um, what we found when we, so we put out, like we had an email list and we put out an open call, Who you know, we're now screening mediums because we got this grant. And there were already hundreds of mediums on there. And we, of the mediums we screened, about 25% couldn't pass our, again, on that day with that deceased person and that sitter. So um, it's not, there, you know, dip, like we're, I'm always cautious. I always caution people when you see a medium say or on their website, they go, oh, I'm 90% accurate. What does that mean on, on a single, is that your best? Does that mean on average? Is that with a specific kind of death? Like it, that those kind of numbers are really meaningless. Um, so it, if someone gets paid more and is famous, that doesn't necessarily mean it's just what the market will bear. It doesn't mean they're a better medium. So the the team that we put together, we were looking for research mediums. So people who who understood the limitations of research, we have to follow these rules um, and with blinding and all those sorts of things. And, and um, we wanted people who wanted to, that, that were just as interested in the answers as we were and uh, could do dedicate the time. And someone who's famous or has a TV show, they don't have that time anyway. And it's not like they would, they would bring more to the team because they're famous. Like w what we were looking for were people who could participate on a team in a research setting. What's your impression of some of the famous ones like John Edward or Teresa Caputo or, you know, the Long Island I've, medium? I Can, haven't tested them in the lab, so I don't have any opinion. Well, you've watched those shows probably. I mean, <laughs> no, what, no, you haven't. Wow. No. Do you think ER doctors watch ER? I don't know. Eh, maybe don't not. It'd be like a bus man's holiday. <laughs> all I, all, if I watch those, I would just be angry at the, 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 the unblindedness of it. And yeah, and there's a lot of editing, right? The the way, in my understanding, the way those shows are shot, right? There's a camera on the person as they come in the door. So they've clearly like already signed a release before they came in the door. So it's it's a lot it's a lot less uh, reality than it seems with all the editing. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, a question came in from Chris on Long Island, speaking of Long Island Medium, um, <laughs> which is kind of similar to the one I asked, but perhaps you can embellish a bit. He said, or she, uh, what is the highest level of accuracy achieved by any one Windbridge medium? And are there any readings that really amazed you personally? Yeah, we don't look at it like that because it's not scientifically or statistically 
that doesn't mean anything, the best one or the worst one, that doesn't mean anything. We just want to look at the, is the phenomenon real? So we are, we average everything. Hmm. And that's, that's the only meaningful number are these averages. And what's interesting is under these quintuple blinded conditions, on average, the mediums scored 50% accurate. But it was, that was statistically higher than what the what the decoy readings were scored which was only 30 percent accurate and that's so because people are only so different so if you say brown hair like that's gonna be um applicable to more than one person so 30 percent and i've talked to other researchers in other countries who do mediumship research and they found the same exact number about 30 percent of any reading could apply to any person mm. or could apply to a variety of people yeah, and I should point out that 50% accurate doesn't mean 50% like it like you'd get with a coin toss, uh, because any degree of accuracy is pretty remarkable. People are coming up with things that they shouldn't couldn't really know through mundane ordinary means. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a good point. Thank you. That's the percent accuracy of all the items. Like so, each item gets scored. And then uh, the other thing we do is, right, the sitter is given two readings. One is the one that was intended for them, that's called a target reading, and then one is a decoy, and they don't know which is which, and they do all the item scores, and then they give each whole reading a score, and then we say, pick which one, pick which one of these two that you think is yours. And that would be 50% accuracy is what would be expected by chance, but it's much, it's not 90%, but it's higher than that. I'm sorry, I don't have that number the top of my head, I want to say it's like 63%. Mm -hmm. I don't have that number in front of me. That's okay. But it, regardless, it was statistically significant, the, the difference. Yeah. Here's another question from Uncle Harold. Um, if mediums were actually real, they could win the lottery. Okay. Uncle Harold is ruining your, your dinner. <laughs> <laughs> right. While you try and chew your... Yeah. Um, that is not something that mediums report being able to do. And that's not how psychic functioning works. It's, um, that's, a, those, that's a lot of data to pull in six numbers. That's a lot of data. So even like the best of psychics would have difficulty with that. That is not in line with the psychic abilities that have been demonstrated in the lab. And it's not something mediums say they can do. So why would you expect that they could do that? Yeah. So it's it, just illogical. It also suggests that they should be able to foresee the future because those numbers haven't been drawn yet. Right. Right. Although I believe you did tell one story about a medium reading which did predict a future event. You know about the Philadelphia Eagles? Oh, yeah. The medium shared that, yeah, that she was doing a, a group reading and... Uh, a grandmother came through, I think, and was talking to her daughter, um, the mother of the grandson. And the, the grandmother said to the daughter, your son, the grandson, is going to be really happy, you know, come February 1st or whatever. Um, and he was a huge uh, Eagles fan. Yeah. Right, yeah. So that was her impression was that, that the that the deceased had um, spilled the beans um, on the table that <laughs> yeah. day. You guys should have bet on it or something. <laughs> <clears throat> um, all right, another of Uncle Harold's questions was pretty much already answered, but um, and here's, one, here's another the final one from Uncle Harold. We've already kind of touched on this, but I think there's more we could say about it. Um, how, how could life after death even happen? When the brain dies, that's it, game over. Yeah, we did cover that. So the theory of materialism says the brain creates consciousness. So if that's true, then yeah, as with the brain is gone, then consciousness is gone. But that's not true. I mean, think about how often our cells turn over. Like every night, you're, a sixth of your skin gets replaced. And so how could we possibly think that this body is somehow permanent and this brain is somehow permanent? Um, when our body is turning over all the time, all, you know, so much of our body is bugs and viruses. So it's not even all you, it's not, it does not stable. It's not permanent. 
Um, and so this alternative theory to materialism is called non-local consciousness. So that, again, that's the theory that consciousness is like a signal and the brain is just the antenna. So when, the, like you said, when the radio breaks, the signal's still coming out of the radio station, right? The, the consciousness can still exist outside of the, whether the brain is alive or not. Yeah. And so that's how it can continue to live after the, the body dies. Yeah, I mean, that point about the bugs in our body, we, out of the many trillions of cells we have, most of them are non-human. The, the microbiome is just... Uh, but it's, 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 the data are, it's, they, it's equal numbers. Oh, there are as equal? many of them as there are of us. They're much, much smaller than us, but yeah. there are as many of them as there are of us. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there's one other point to throw in here, and... I, this came up in last week's um, conversation with Jim Tucker about reincarnation because, you know, some people will distinguish, they'll say, okay, fine, consciousness is non-local, but how is it that an individual entity continues, you know, um, once the body dies? Uh, and so the ex there's an explanation from Eastern traditions with, which uh, they use the word koshas or sheaths. I'm actually showing a graphic of it on the screen right now, which means there's a, we have a subtle body which has various levels to it. And uh, when the f flesh and blood body dies, the subtle body continues on. And it's, that's the vehicle through which we could sort of be communicating with others from the other side or through which we could reincarnate into another physical body. <clears throat> just thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, um, that's above my pay grade. I don't know how this works. That's my my job. My job is to bring it in the lab and, <laughs> and see if it if it can can uh, demonstrate itself, and it can. And but what that means in the larger sense, yeah. Again, that's above my pay grade. Yeah, but um, do you ever contemplate it though? Do you sort of think like, how does this work? I mean, where are they exactly? Are they in a physical place, kind of broadcasting to us? Are they in a parallel dimension? And do they have bodies? I mean, do you ask yourself those kinds of questions, just even personally, if not as a scientist? Yeah, just yeah, personally, I do. Um, cause, yeah, once you again, once I had that very first mediumship reading, that's the only mediumship reading I have ever had. But that really opened up like, well, wait, what else is my science textbook saying that isn't true? And it really opens up um, to, to think, to start to think about these things. And, you know, I have, I have gone on to um, embrace other modalities of healthcare. I have a, I have a chronic neurological disease um, I, that it's not managed by Western medicine. So I have to go and look elsewhere. And I've learned a lot about a lot of different things and found the things that work for me. So, and that sort of support this idea of non-local consciousness or that at least information is, is, can move through space and time. Um, so you're saying that um, your mediumship studies made you more open-minded and it impacted your personal life in terms of willingness to look into alternative medicine and things like that? Yeah, I don't think I'm any more open-minded. I've always been a good scientist, so I've always followed the data. I just never heard of those things. And once you're, you know, you sort of put a crack in the, in the facade, like, oh, a lot of things can spill through. And so, I, yeah, I just was around people that knew about all these other things and um, and and looked into those because again, when you have a chronic health disorder and you're always on the lookout for something that can help. Yeah, a question came in from Wendy Fellows in Altadena. I think that's in California, uh, which we've kind of answered. But I think there's a couple more things we could say about it. And her question is: Is there any scientific way to prove there is an afterlife? And to me, the word "prove" jumps out at me there because that's a rather strong word for anything in science. Yeah, scientists don't try and prove anything. Um, we ask questions and, and get answers. So, uh, but we have collected, this gets very complicated. Um, but so we talked about wh whatever a medium is doing under blinded conditions where they're not using uh, sensory information to get the information about the deceased person, they're using some kind of psi, they're using some kind of psychic ability, psi, the Greek letter psi, PSI, the, uh, the word psi, is an umbrella term that, that 
encompasses all these psychic abilities, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, and psychokinesis. So whatever a medium is doing is psi. And so, we, so once you control for the sensory things, you go, it's definitely psi, but there's two kinds of psi that it could be. And the, these are, this gets technical, but there, one theory is called survival psi, which is the medium is communicating tele, telepathically with the survived consciousness, of the deceased person. And the other theory is called somatic psi. It's based on the word soma, which means body. And that, so if they're using somatic psi, they're, they're simply reading the body of knowledge in the psychic reservoir, or they're reading the, from the living sitter. And so we use the word soma, somatic, to represent the sitter and the psychic reservoir. So it's one of, either one of those things. And no matter what a medium says, it could be either one. So, um, like the let's talk about the Eagles example, right? Winning the Super Bowl. Um, she could be using her own precognition to say that, or a deceased person could be telling that to her. And there's no way we can tell the difference based on the content. You cannot determine source from content. So, we went a different way and we asked the mediums about their experiences. And that, that field of study is called phenomenology. And there's all kinds of phenomenological research in all kinds of fields. But if you ask a medium, they know what regular psychic functioning feels like and communication from the deceased feels different. And so we've done a number of research studies that um, qualitatively and quantitatively looked at those differences in the medium's experiences and we even did one where the mediums were blinded. So we did do a target, do a reading for this target and do another reading for the, and one was a living target and one was a deceased target and they were blinded and they didn't know which was which. And then we said, okay, now fill out this questionnaire about your experiences. And we found that they experienced love to a greater degree when communicating with the deceased than when uh, doing a psychic reading for a living person. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I would suggest to Wendy that you know not only the topic of today's interview, but um, you know look into um, there's a categorical index on BatGap.com, and there's one category is for out of body experiences. Um, those are very interesting, and uh, they pretty clearly demonstrate that um, one can have conscious experience <laughs> even at a distance when the body is. Um, incapacitated in some ways, um, such as, and th this is closely related to near-death experiences also. So th there are a lot of things, and, and um, Jim Tucker's reincarnation studies uh, is, are, are very interesting. Um, I won't elaborate on them now, but I just did his interview last week. So spend a few hours looking at those things, and I think you'll find it convincing. So with this, the mediumship data, they're they're reporting accurate information under blinded conditions, so that has to be psi. And when you look at the phenomenology data, it's they claim that they're talking to the dead, and that's what the data supports. So that provides scientific evidence that mediums are communicating with the survived consciousnesses of people who have died. Yeah. Um... Question came from Dan Mitchell in Sparta. I never know where these cities are. That's either in Greece or in Georgia, I think. <laughs> Probably Georgia. Um, would you explain how a triple blind study works? Now, you do quintuple blind studies, but um, I guess he just wants to know a little bit more about this blinding process. And, what, and for the non-scientists, what the word blinding means? Let's make sure we're clear on that. Okay, so blinding is a, is a system used in research where different people are prevented from knowing different types of information. So we call um, our protocol quintuple blind because there's five levels of blinding. So the medium is blinded to information about the sitter. Um, the sitter is blinded to which reading was intended for them. And then there are three experimenters who are blinded to various pieces of information. I'd previously published a, a journal article where we called it triple blind and it's the same thing oh i see yeah yeah it's that the, the, and when that paper was published there were uh i was working with research assistants and they 
that we didn't think of that as we didn't think of them as people. No, I don't want to say that, but <laughs> it, it, it's really the same thing. It's the same level of blinding in both cases. Yeah, I know Jim Tucker hates the ter- that I use the term quintuple blinding because he is a doctor and he like double is as far as he's willing to go. Like either the people are all blinded or they're not. And so he doesn't like that word quintuple, but we just want to demonstrate that there are five people involved in the protocol and they're all blinded to different pieces of information. Mm-hmm. Good. So you're being very careful. That's essentially it. <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, okay. So it kind of sounded like from things I've heard you say that, you know, you're not taking on new mediums and a lot of the mediums you were working with uh, aren't actively doing it anymore, at least with you. No, so just, no, just two. Just So we still have a team of 18. Oh, okay. So you still, because yeah. I was wondering what, what keeps you busy these days. So, yeah. <laughs> so most of them you still do, but you don't need to take on new ones because 18 is enough. Yeah. 18 is enough to, to um, have a good N for any study. Yeah. A good number. And so are you learning new things? I mean, you've been working with these 18 for some many m- number of years now. Um, is it the same thing over and over again, or are you kind of breaking new ground? That's a good question. Um, so what we did in 2017, because we thought, well, they're representative of the larger population of mediums. So whatever we find with them, is they'll, it's just sort of generalizable to mediums, you know, on the, in the whole. And we said, well, let's think about that. Is that true? So what we did in 2017 was we did a, a survey study and we asked uh, mediums all over the country to fill out various questionnaires and that sort of thing. And we had, it was like close to 130 mediums. We did one study um, where we, we looked at, well, it's very, there's a lot of different pieces, but we looked at the, the uh, we compared mediums and non-mediums with their and uh, psychology and their various scores on various tests. And some of the mediums were our Winbridge mediums, and some of them were self-identified mediums from the public, from the world. And so we did a number of studies where we where we we did look at do these data are they generalizable? Is our little population of Winbridge certified research mediums? representative of the larger population and it looked like that is the case but we did collect a lot more information from this wider population of mediums Mm. i heard you say perhaps it was in your book uh, that there's a higher than average quite higher than average incidence of certain health problems in mediums than with the general population such as migraines and two or three other things you mentioned Um, you want to comment on that a little bit yeah, so um, in that, in uh, what you read, heard, uh, was from the Winbridge mediums, the limited, right, the, the just the ones on our team. And that's one of the things that we did want to uh, look at in the survey, because I have an autoimmune disease. And so in just talking with him, I learned that a lot of them on our team had autoimmune diseases as well. And I thought, well, is that common? And so in our survey, we did look at that. We did ask uh, a bigger population of mediums, and it did it what it it did ring true. So uh, the mediums in the study uh, reported higher levels of incidence of autoimmune diseases than the non-mediums in the study who were matched for gender, race, and age. So it was the the majority, um, the average is uh, white women in their fifties. That's our that's our population. So if you look at white women in their 50s, uh, predominantly, uh, who identifies mediums and compare that to white women in their 50s who identifies not mediums, the mediums report a much higher level of general disease burden. Like we just had a big list of symptoms um, and the different uh, organ systems that people have. So the mediums reported more just general symptoms and uh, more autoimmune diseases specifically. Hmm. I had a spiritual teacher for many years, and the first time I ever saw him on a course, he gave a whole talk about mediums, and he discouraged us from getting involved in it because he said it might 
be interesting information. It might be valid information, but it's bad for the medium. It breaks down the mind-body coordination. But he was referring specifically to um, a spirit or entity or something taking control of the medium's personality or nervous system and kind of put, putting them off in a corner and then speaking through them that way. And I don't think that's what your mediums are doing, even though they, it, they do seem to have... Well, I'll stop there and let you comment. Okay. Um, yeah, when mediumship research began in the 1880s, the mediums that uh, were being studied were, um, the way they would do readings would be in seances, and they would achieve full trance, and so, and they would let, uh, it's called a spirit control, take over the body and speak through their throat and their voice. Um, and so when the reading was over, you couldn't do any phenomenology research with them because they weren't there when the reading happened. They were unconscious, basically. So you couldn't ask them about their um, their experiences. So that's one of the reasons why we were able to do that in modern times, because the most of the mediums um, do not achieve full trance or let a spirit control take over them. My personal theory is that's because women have rights now, and we're not going to let a, a, someone else take over our body. Um, that is my personal opinion. Uh, but the, the data are that most mediums practicing in the U.S. aren't achieving full trance. Some do, some do sometimes. It's, it's a continuum. So um, that, that was my, when I was hearing about the mediums on our team having these autoimmune diseases, that's what I was thinking. Like, oh, because you're bringing, because they feel, the, the, the experience that the medium has is what we call multimodal. They see things, they smell things, they taste things, and they feel things in their body. So my theory was, oh, well, because you're feeling so many people's cause of death and ailments, your body is getting confused about what is self and what is other, and that's why you're getting autoimmune diseases. That doesn't seem to be the reason. We did, um, in our survey um, study, we looked at uh, the idea of um, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and the mediums did score really high versus the non-mediums in having experiences of child childhood abuse and trauma. And even in the mainstream literature, that connection is well established, that childhood trauma causes adult disease. So that my uh, conclusion was that it's not mediumship that causes disease, it's childhood trauma that causes mediumship and disease. That's very interesting. Do you think it's because somehow the childhood trauma just cracks us open in certain ways that we otherwise would not be? Opened. That's that's one of the theories. There's theories that it interrupts, I think is what your teacher might have been saying, it interrupts the energetic pathways. Um, it allows, it, it requires the development of psychic ability because in, in those kind of situations, you don't know where the danger is coming from and you have to be able to acquire information that there's no way you could know otherwise. There's no sensory, logical way you could know. So you develop psychic ability to be able to predict where and when danger is coming. And then once you can do that, now you, you're open to all these other kinds of psychic abilities. Yeah. It almost seems like mediumship is kind of a curse and a blessing. It's like a, almost a, a, a wounding in a way from having had these traumatic childhood experiences. You're, you're somehow damaged, but the damage somehow makes you, gives you capabilities you wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah, and I want to point out because people in in uh, question chats like the one that you have have asked like, well, if if there does adult trauma result in me? No, there's no data that adult trauma results in a uh, medium or a psychic ability. So please don't put yourself in danger in an attempt to acquire <laughs> psychic ability. Yeah, right. Uh, um, before we get too far from. The thing we were discussing a minute ago, I want to bring up Edgar Casey, who obviously was, well, firstly, he was a man, but he, he was also a trance medium. I don't, you can tell us better than I know, but as I understand it, when he came out of a reading, he, don't, he didn't know what he said. He was gone, and it's, all this stuff was just coming through him. Is that, is that right? Um, I don't know specifically. I won't, I won't comment on, on Edgar Casey specifically, um, but that is the general... Um, 
idea of what happens when mediums go into full trance. So me, like the term trance medium isn't an, it really accurate because some mediums, even in their own practice, they'll go into different levels of trance. Um, so we, we, uh, we, we talk about there's two kinds of mediumship, mental, where a medium receives communication from a deceased person and conveys the messages to the living. And then there's what's called physical mediumship, where the medium is at the center of physical phenomena, like voices, um, apports, so objects that just appear out of thin air, things like that. Um, so that that's the two kinds. And then the level of trance in either one of those is all along the continuum. So some physical mediums might go into full trance, some mental mediums might go into full trance, and some um, of each type have very shallow um, trance of uh, consciousness. Do you happen to know whether Edgar Casey was traumatized as a child or whether he I had? I do not. Any, yeah, I or, do not know that. And I, I don't. Do not know. And, and we, you don't probably know whether he was unhealthy as a result of his mediumship or anything like that. Huh. Yeah, no, I don't know. I'm sure that that information is available. I was just curious. <clears throat> um, Question from Irene. Uh, the readings I have seen in which the deceased relative very clearly comes through seem to always happen when the living relative is harboring some deep guilt or grief. The deceased friend or relative comes through with the messages with messages of forgiveness and love and allows the living person to greatly lighten their load and move on. The most profound and accurate readings I have seen have a real need or purpose to them. I find this very inspiring. So my expertise is in this bringing mediumship into the laboratory. And in our readings, we ask these very specific questions. What did the person look like? How did they die? Those sorts of things. But we do, one of the questions we do ask is, does the person have any messages for the sitter, the absent sitter, who will read this in a transcript? Um, because we do want to optimize the environment. The purpose of a mediumship reading is to connect we talk about it as triangulated, right? It, it's a it's a it's a uh, a three part system where it, the medium connects the deceased person with the sitter, and so of course, what you know, why would you want to connect with the people in your life? It would be to say things like that. So if there are un um, unresolved things in a relationship, whether the person is in their body or not, then yeah, there would be. Uh, impetus to to bring those things up and to talk about those things it just makes sense. Yeah, I've heard you mention um, physical things that could even be detected with a camera if there was one there, such as tables shaking or things breaking or I don't know uh, that kind of stuff, things levitating or, or whatnot. Um, have you um, actually ever witnessed any of those things in your studies, or is that, this just uh, anecdotes that you've heard in this realm of mediumship? Um, I mean, when we when that when physical mediumship is defined, those kind of things are listed in the literature and in in the in the um, in all of the books. <laughs> um, my studies are with mental mediums. Um, my husband, Mark Bacuzzi studies he has done research with physical mediumship so he he did some studies with um table tipping and where he used thermal imaging cameras to to document uh any and all kinds of cool things i won't even it's all technology and i it's not my thing i'll let him talk to you about that at some point um but my my primary uh research is with mental medium so i don't really know a whole lot about physical mediumship hmm. So, in physical mediumship, is the medium somehow facilitating? Well, I shouldn't ask you many. You just said you don't know much about it. But <laughs> anyway, I'll just ask: is the is the medium somehow facilitating those physical events, um, or the the presence of the medium is making those physical events more likely to happen as a way of convincing people that something's really going on? Is that is that the point of it? I don't really know about the phenomenology of of the of physical mediums. I know um, there's a book called Surviving Death that journalist Leslie Kane put together. She had written a book about UFOs where she put evidence together from pilots and weather 
um, experts, and she basically just presented the data and said, you decide what it is. And she wanted to do the same thing again with survival research. So like I wrote a chapter in her book, Jim Tucker wrote a chapter in her book, and she does cover physical mediumship in that book. Again, it's called Surviving Death. So I would point people to that or um, on our website there on the Winbridge Research Center website, uh, winbridge.org. I know we have uh, that um, article that Mark wrote, the journal article that Mark wrote about his um, physical mediumship study that he did. Okay, good. Um, there's a section in your book about animals coming through, you know, when me, through, through me, with mediums. And uh, everybody loves animals. You have a couple of dogs. We have a couple of dogs. Um, you have some interesting stories you can tell about this? Um, we, we took our quintuple blind protocol and we replicated it with, instead of deceased people, it was deceased companion animals. And we saw similar data to what we see with people. And when I presented this, the, the pilot data, the initial, like what I'd collected at the time data, um, at a scientific conference, the line, you know, people get up from the conference and stand at the microphone to ask a question. The line was nearly out the door. <laughs> Scientists were sobbing. Oh. It really brings out, um, it's a much different kind of grief mm -hmm. because you, there are people in the world who don't think, oh, it's, people say it's just a dog. Are you kidding me? It's a member of my family and I love her the same. And her consciousness, just because she can't talk, doesn't mean her consciousness is any different than ours. Um, I think it was Socrates said, the, um, the soul is the, seven, the the soul is the same in all living creatures. Only the body is different. So it just makes sense. Why would why would we be the only ones that our consciousness survived? So we did the study. The data looked good. We had to stop the study because the people it was it's so blinded. Right, the people don't get to talk to the medium. It's just a it's just a they just get emailed at the time. This was before online um, questionnaires were available. They just get emailed a Word document with like description. It, the people were suffering too much um, in the study that we didn't feel it was ethical to keep doing that to people who had lost animals. But um, lots of mediums bring through. That's how uh, we talk about, I will try and stay on track with my sentence. We talk about there are three kinds of information that mediums bring through. The first is information identifying of the discarnate. The second is things that have happened in the sitter's life since the death. And the third are messages. Like if the medium just started out with, he says he loves you, that's not meaningful. You have to identify the person first, prove to me it's you, and then prove to me you're still around. So we talk about those three kinds of things as, it's me, it's me, I'm here, I'm here, I love you, I love you. So with the, um, it's me, one of the things that was coming through in the, in the research with deceased people was the, the, the discarnate would say, oh, I have the little white dog with me. And so we were seeing animals were coming through. And so that was the observation that we made. And so we replicated the protocol with deceased animals. And again, it worked, it, the, and lots of mediums report um, animals, and some of them specialize in it. Of, of bringing through deceased companion animals. And it worked, but again, the, just the ethics of, because it's a different kind of grief, um, we just weren't able to continue that study. Hmm. We used to have, we had a cat die one time many years ago, and for s several days after she died, we kept being woken up at night by hearing her cry. And it wasn't like she had been crying a lot before she died or anything. We just like woken up by a cat crying sound and there wasn't any you know our windows weren't open or anything like that it was just we really felt like you know she, she's talking to us yeah uh, um and yeah. lots of people have those kind of experiences and um and we we would call that a spontaneous after-death communication right it was your phenomenology it was your experience that that was your cat and so we have to take that seriously that was your experience and a lot of people report spontaneous after-death communication experiences from their deceased people and their deceased animals. So what the Winbridge Research Center, our primary uh, mission is to alleviate suffering 
around dying, death, and what comes next. So we want to be able to normalize those kind of things so that when you tell someone they, that story, they're not like, you're a lunatic, <laughs> right? We want, to, we want to put it in the world that, no, these are real experiences. It's valid. Consciousness survives. Of course, it can come back and talk to you um, or cry at you, whatever the case may be. Uh, and we want to, we want to um, provide. So the way that we accomplish our mission is by performing rigorous scientific research and then creating free educational materials. So with our educational materials, we want to be able to show people these are real experiences. They have science behind them and they're normal and we, can't, we need to stop discounting them and we need to stop disparaging them in our society. Yeah. So are those educational materials on your website? They are. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, I mentioned I interviewed Jim Tucker last week who studies children who remember past lives. <clears throat> and I put up a, you know, a, a notice of that interview on my Facebook page. And a number of people chimed in and said, oh, yeah, my kids, you know, they when they were two or three years old, they were talking about past lives. And, and you know, the people never reported it to any, anybody or did anything about it. But it, it made it sound like it was kind of a common phenomenon. And in fact, Jim and I were talking about how it may happen way more commonly than we realize because, you know, perhaps even before kids are pre are, are verbal, they, they're remembering things clearly, but they can't express it. <clears throat> so I wonder if, if in the same vein, there is a lot of um, mediumship stuff going on. And, you know, you've only seen the tip of the iceberg in terms of people who actually pursue it as a career or get in touch with you about it or anything like that. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Um, and one of the reasons why it's important to be studying mediums is that people are getting readings from mediums and we need to understand that better. So we did the accuracy testing, we're doing the phenomenology and the, you know, we're looking at um, disease burden and childhood trauma and those kind of things, psychology, uh, like what we found in our research was mediums, again, compared to non-mediums of the same gender, uh, race and age uh, profile, are less neurotic um, than, and they're uh, on a different test, their psychological well being is stronger. So they're not, the mediums are not crazy. They're not um, weird. Uh, their psychological well being is actually stronger than non mediums in our study. So these are the kind of things that we need to understand and who should be getting a reading and when and what kinds of death are maybe better for it or worse for it. And so we're trying to, we serve four populations at um, the center, um, the general population, mediums, researchers, and clinicians. So what do healthcare providers, mental health care professionals, and uh, general health providers uh, need to know about mediumship. If they have a higher disease prevalence, then maybe your general practitioner should know that when you come in and say, I'm a medium, they know to look for these kind of things um, because you're, you may have a higher tendency to have these things. And uh, we also want to train uh, mental health professionals. I work with uh, um, a licensed um, social worker from Texas. Her name's Beth Christofferson. And she was really interested in, in that many years ago, several years ago, the World Health Organization called out that religion and spirituality were important for people's health. And they started putting together questionnaires that doctors are supposed to ask patients about religion and spirituality. But they none of these questionnaires um, include questions about the afterlife or experiences that you've had with your person that you may have lost. So... Um, Beth put together a um, instrument and she and I wrote a paper and there's a free fact, the paper is free and the fact sheet is free um, on our website where it trains, it's an instrument that clinicians can use because what she was hearing from her colleagues was, I don't talk about the afterlife in my practice because I don't know how to ask. I don't know what to say. And so she put together this instrument that clinicians, mental health professionals can use in their practice to feel confident in being able to talk about the afterlife because people want to talk about it. They want to know it's not weird. They want to know it's common. And so this instrument includes um, direction for of uh, if you want to point people to other resources, it, it, it's a, it's a, 
conclusive uh, instrument that would it trains clinicians on how to how to incorporate afterlife beliefs and experiences into their mental health practices. Mm. Yeah, I know uh, Dan Ian Brinkley, who had a bunch of near-death experiences, he ended up dedicating himself, maybe he's still doing it, to working in, um, you know, homes where people are going to be dying pretty soon. I forget what you call those homes. Uh, but assuaging people's fear um, of death and based upon his own experience that, in fact, you don't really die. And, and you know, providing a lot of relief to people thereby. Yeah, think about how much money families could save and the society could save if we stopped if we really really believed that consciousness is primary and even when the body dies consciousness can continue to live on what what if we really believe that and we stopped trying to keep bodies alive and we just let bodies go bodies are going to die that's what bodies do and we don't know how much trauma that's causing the consciousness to be trapped inside the body for this extended amount of time where we just are keeping it alive on machines, um, you know, and causing ongoing trauma to the family, try, you know, watching that body suffer. Yeah. And if we, if we, as a society could, that you could decide and I could decide when it's my time to go, I'm going to go, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold on. I'm not going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to go when it's my time. And we, we would save a lot of money and a lot of heartache and a lot of trauma to ourselves and our family. Um, if doctors stopped thinking of death as a failure, bodies are going to die. It's a part of life. Yeah. I don't know the percentages, but I've heard that, you know, a large percentage of the total ex healthcare expenditure in a person's life on average is, you know, is uh, incurred in the final weeks or months, you know, where they're in intensive care and it's just this huge expensive thing. Uh, and, you know, that has implications for being able to provide universal health care and make it affordable to the whole society. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. No, these are really important pieces. And mainstream research isn't addressing these things you know we know we know through mainstream research right a doctor spends the closer and closer a person a patient is to dying the less and less time the doctor will spend in their room in the hospital so we know that um and we we have um at the Wimbridge research center we have a scientific advisory board of experts in the field jim tucker is on our board of people um, to provide input on protocols but we also have a clinical advisory board of mental health professionals and uh, and doctors um, who are working in intensive care and those sorts of things, watching people go through that process all the time. So we we need to get this information out. We um, we put together a uh, I don't I don't like to use the word pamphlet because it sounds like it's an advertisement, but it's a it's a pamphlet about end of life experiences and so what and what to expect so that's available for free on our website in the fact sheet um, section of the education page but so you can print that out it's pretty um, it's comforting and so um, families of people who you know are dying the dying themselves can look at that and so the, it's not so scary we know people die a lot of people have died we know what to expect we know what's coming and if we if you were educated about if people were educated about that it would be less scary so again that's what we're trying to do at the center is alleviate suffering so we put together these free materials that people can use yeah most of the near-death experience story people that i've heard or talked to they don't have a death wish, but they all say, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I mean, I'm enjoying life, but um, you know, I'm not at all concerned about dying. You know, I've been there, done that, and it's it's glorious. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of fascinated by it. Like, like what what is it like to live and ha not be trapped in this meat bag? <laughs> right? Like, to just, like, can I go anywhere? Can I know anything? Right? I have a neighbor that lives two doors down from me, and she and I... She, her she and her husband met in high school and so they've known their they went to college together and i was at college at the same time that they were at college like we all went to the same college but we never knew each other so that's going to be my first question 
when I die is like, how many times was I in the same room with her? <laughs> how many times did I pass her in the student union? And I never knew. I want to know all those times. Hmm. Um, and so I'm fascinated with this um, this idea that outside, not being trapped in the body. I wrote a, I did a presentation um, at, a, at a meeting and then I wrote an article about it and it's called, You're Not Even In There Now. And it's this idea of, based on my medical background, that this and this tissue turnover, and those kind of things, and and that we're half bugs, and that like this isn't me. Um, and there's a lot of cool research, um, mainstream research. They never talk about um, non-local consciousness in these mainstream papers, but there's a lot of uh, research where they do. Um, there's like one called rubber hand illusion and you put your hand on the table and then they they replace it when you're not looking no you're looking you know what they're doing with a rubber hand and then they like stroke your hand at the time that someone else is stroking the rubber hand and so you your mind goes oh okay that's our hands now okay and then if they hit it with a hammer you will react with adrenaline because you your body thinks that's your hand and it works with full body illusion experiments as well it's really easy to fool the mind into thinking that you are somewhere else and so only with we have constant constant feedback from our senses um and like proprioception where we feel like we are in the world that it can we can it's just continual evidence like i'm in here I'm in here, I'm in here. But if you interrupt, it's so easily interrupted, you're you're just barely in there. Like it would, it's gonna be easy to be done if we really learn how to how to do that, how to know we're not really in here. And um, so I'm interested in developing um, other ways that we can demonstrate that to the living, to the healthy living. Like, oh, you're not even in there now. So it's not <laughs> scary that sometime soon you're gonna be not in here because you're not even in there now. You remind me of a line from Good Morning Vietnam where Robin Williams had to get really early to start the radio show and he's kind of like dragging himself down the hallway. He said, I'm not even in my body. <laughs> yeah, and none of us are. Yeah. Well, we are and we aren't. I mean, you know, we, I don't want to get too abstract, but it's like what we really are the universe is in us. It's not, we're not this little pinpoint of, of life in a vast universe. The vast universe is contained within the, an unboundedly vast self, which is what we are. You know, it's like when we think of, oh, we should take care of nature. We are nature. We're in nature. We're part of nature. So, yeah, we're part of the universe. We're not separate from it. Yeah, a few minutes ago, you were, I was reminded of a story from Yogananda's autobiography of where he had a pet deer in his ashram or something, and he overfed the deer on warm milk or something like that, and the, the deer was dying because it had gorged itself. And, um, <clears throat> and Yogananda loved the deer, and he was holding it in his lap, and he was just sort of wishing and praying that the deer would live, and the deer would live. And, and th then at a certain point, the, the voice of the deer, or, or the spirit of the deer, came to him very clearly and said, let me go. It's my time to go. You know, you're holding me back. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I did that. I held on to the previous dog that we had, I did not want her to go. I, um, and she just was, she just was so lethargic and it was like, she had really bad hip problems. She had trouble getting around. It was definitely her time, but I, I feel really bad about this to this day. I would not let her go. And at some point we decided, and I was, she was laying down outside and I called the vet and I, who does home house calls sometimes. And I said, can you come over and put her down in our house? And while I was on the phone with him, she came over to me. She like was just sitting down outside all content. She got up, came over to me and like, yeah, what you're doing is the right thing. Yeah, and yeah. She, you know, encouraged me, I think, to make this phone call to the vet. So and imagine if we could do that with our human bodies, like, no, it's my time. Let's, let's, let's get out of here. I'm done.
Well, some people do um, sign waivers and stuff, right? Saying, no, don't, don't sustain me on life support or anything like that. I want to check right. out. Yeah. Yeah. I was just uh, well, I was just reading about Richard Feynman the other day, the physicist, and um, he had some serious problem, and his kidneys were shot. And at a certain point, you know, they said, "Well, we can put you on dialysis, and you'll live a couple more months, maybe." And he said, "No, man, I've you know, I've lived a great life. I've accomplished what I want to accomplish. I'm out of here." <laughs> right. It's this difference between like the quantity of days versus the quality of life. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of we're we're sort of you know, really dwelling on this one point, but it needs to be dwelt on, I think, because still the way the society functions, no matter what people may believe that, you know, so many Christians think you're going to heaven or Hindus think you're going to be reincarnated or whatever, there, there's, you know, it doesn't seem to work out that way in practice. There's so many people being kept alive beyond the point of hope of returning and having any quality of life, although there are rare examples where that kind of thing happens. Um, but if we really understood that, you know, when the physical body dies, that's not the end of us. It, it's kind of like hanging on to, a, you know, you have a, a 1987 Chevy or something that you're still driving around and, and it's breaking down all the time. You're spending all this money on repairs and, you know, you could be in a nice, you know, brand new one, maybe a Tesla. <laughs> Right. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, maybe we all get a Tesla when we die. We don't know. Uh, <laughs> Tesla I heard body. A, I heard, yeah, right. That'd be awesome. I heard a, someone who had a near-death experience describe, like, someone said, well, when you were out of your body and looking down, like, what did you think of your body? And she goes, it was like a like a jacket. Like, yep, that's my jacket, but if, it's go, if someone loses it, like, I'm not going to be upset about that. That was the attachment that she had to the jacket. Yeah, um, the, Bhagavad the, Gita use, the Bhagavad Gita uses that very same metaphor. They say the body is like a suit of clothes, and just as you, you know, discard worn-out clothes and put on new ones, you do that with bodies. Yeah, yeah, I'm fascinated with what it's going to be like to not be stuck in here, and again, what I lovingly refer to as the meat bag. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, we're we're in the body now. Like, let's make the most of that. And then when that experience is over, let's move on and do something else. Yeah, when my mother died, she died of ovarian cancer. Um, I'm sorry. Well, it was a long time ago, 30 years ago or more. And she, she had tried to commit suicide three times herself, but then she, um, she wasn't a pharmacist, so she just took a lot of my father's phenobarbital, and somehow she was discovered and her stomach was pumped and she lived. Anyway, I got her onto meditation, and she, it really turned her around, and she lived quite a happy life for many years. But then when she was finally dying, um, I remember we were in the hospital room, and she was saying to the doctors, now don't try to keep me alive unnecessarily and all that. And then she finally checked out, and uh, we were sitting in the room with her body, and, and my wife said, that she heard her say, hi, Irene. It's like the whoop de doo you know. <laughs> this is really great. Just saying hi. <laughs> a couple of years ago, the NIH put, um, put it out there, a uh, request for proposals. They wanted to study, um, uh, I'll get the word wrong. It's, it used to be called terminal lucidity. I think it's now oh, yeah, called para yeah. paradoxical lucidity because mm -hmm. they didn't want to have the word terminal to scare people, but they put out um, a call for proposals. We want to know more about paradoxical lucidity, which if people don't know is when someone is um, in the throes of dementia or even in coma, and then they sort of uh, spontaneously become lucid or wake up and have a, a very intelligible conversation with you and then go back and then a little later, Depends, uh, then they pass over, then they die. And so I was like, okay. Uh, so I asked the mediums on our team, have you ever communicated in a reading with someone? And then you later found out from the sitter, oh yeah, that's my mom, but she's not dead. She has dementia or she's in coma. And they, they all said yes. Mm. Every single one of them said yes. Interesting. And so I said, let's look at that. And the NIH said, no, we're not looking at that. <laughs> um, uh, they were not interested. But that's really important, right? Because if someone's in coma, um, they can't make, they can't tell you what they want, but maybe that's something that a medium can do 
Um, and so the way they were describing it, it was like one foot in, one foot out, and that they sort of are coming and going and that they come back into the body, but then they're also like investigating and experiencing what the other side is like, and they're coming back and forth. And if so what if in that situation, the medium could communicate with the person and tell you what their needs were, right? If you didn't have a, um, a DNR, a do not resuscitate order in place, but you, but you were like your mom, you did not want to be resuscitated, and that that paperwork wasn't in place. Maybe a medium could share that with your family, um, for you. And then again, that's a lot less suffering that has to happen. So there's yeah. all these socially applicable um, things that we need to investigate. Yeah, this is an interesting thing. Perhaps we'll even think of a few more of these before we're finished. Um, I'm fascinated by the whole um, practical implications of this thing. You know, uh, we've mentioned several. And it's, it's just worth noting also that with terminal lucidity, sometimes this happens when people's brains are physically deteriorated, you know, with advanced Alzheimer's or something, and yet somehow they're able to function lucidly for a little while um, close to death. Yeah, it, it's, phys it's physiologically impossible what happens. Um, there's one of the early cases, we, um, we publish a journal um, at the center, it's called Threshold, and the, the articles are all free on, on our website, on the Threshold website, and uh, one of our contributors is a, a, an author, and she wrote a paper about this idea of, of terminal lucidity, paradoxical lucidity, and one of the early cases, which I think from the 1800s, was a woman who, she'd been nonverbal since she was like six, she was in a home for um, people that, the, you know, the family can't take care of, so they, they just give them to the home, and the girl just like hadn't talked or moved she couldn't even feed herself i don't think and then near the end of her life she sat up and she sang like a whole hymn you know word for word and then she laid back down and died and so there are there this is not a new phenomenon these cases have been around and it is something that we should look at um as a potential um uh place we can alleviate suffering. Yeah. And then there are other examples of people who have brain injuries or something, and all of a sudden they become excellent jazz pianists or something, that having never really learned to play the piano. There are all these, these abilities dawn. So it, there are implications regarding, you know, what the soul or whatever we are ultimately may know or possess, skills, knowledge, and all that. And perhaps we only um, manifest a certain small portion of it, but there's something can unlock it. Mm. Yeah, the, um, the idea we talked about at that the brain is the antenna. Yeah. So some, so lots of different verbs have been used like that. The, the brain is the receiver, it's the mediator, it's the transmitter, you know, it acts as a funnel um, that, that consciousness is probably bigger, um, but now it has to get like vetted through this, you know, this bag of fat inside your skull, <laughs> um, it's going to have limitations. So, yeah. you know, when that, when the brain isn't really involved anymore, it brings up a good point because people always ask, well, like what, you know, what kind of EEG studies are you doing? And we did an EEG study with our mediums and it did not go well. Um, it's not a good, uh, it's not an ideal method to study mediumship because mediumship you know, the phenomenology is they're receiving it and saying it, right? There's no, they're not um, editing uh, what they say. They're just, they're a, they're a medium, they're a translator. So they're hearing it and saying it. And with EEG, because of the artifacts that muscle movement makes, you can't talk mm. while EEG data is being recorded. Right. So it's not, it's not a good, um, it's not a good method for studying mediumship in its natural environment where they're just talking um, spontaneously. So, and then the other issue is if it's non-local and the medium is talking to the deceased person who doesn't have a body, well, maybe the medium's consciousness is not in her body and they're talking like that. Like maybe if we looked in the brain, if we did MRI studies, which are really expensive, um, we wouldn't even see anything because they're not even in there when it's happening. And um, again, we're, we're interested in what are the real world applications of this? So will, will that help anything to know that about the, the, what the brain is doing? And of course, law enforcement would be another one. Um, you know, medium could say, all right, describe the guy who murdered you. 
you know? What was he wearing? What did he look like? Did he have a beard? You know, things like that. <clears throat> yeah, and there are lots of cases. That was one of the survey questions that we asked was, how, have you ever worked with law enforcement? And a number of mediums um, said yes, and they listed the, the states and the cities and the, the um, departments that they worked with. And that does happen. The And the, the law enforcement officers that have seen it happen will rely on it because they've seen it work, but they won't be public about it. That's very dangerous. I, I don't... Um, I don't uh, think that, I don't, I'm not mad at them. I can't think of the right word. I'm not mad at them for not coming forward. That That's really dangerous. Yeah, well, um, they're meat and potatoes guys, you know, they don't want to yeah. sort of be woo-woo hippie types. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. All right, we, we should wrap it up because this, this is long for you. Um, maybe this will lead us to a, a final sort of wrap-up point. Um, Michael from Long Island again wants to know, um, is the research from Winbridge peer-reviewed, and are there other studies uh, that by other researchers that are trying to replicate your results? If I get lost, remind me of that second piece. So yes, our data is all peer-reviewed. It's review A lot of it's reviewed four, peer-reviewed four times. So we apply for a grant, so the 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 to be accepted, right, our application has to be vetted by our peers, by the people on the committee. Um, then we do the study and then we write a final report, which gets vetted again by our peers. Then we submit um, an abstract for a conference proceedings and that's vetted by our peers. And then when we write a, a journal article and it gets published, that's a peer reviewed journal article. So yeah, our, our, our research is definitely peer reviewed um, a number of times over. And uh, one of our, on our, uh, on the Winbridge Research Center website, winbridge.org, there's a, a research page and an education page. And the top of the education page, the first category is peer-reviewed journal articles. And so all of our stuff is listed there. The ones that we have access to are available. You can download those. Some of our papers are behind the journal's own paywall. So in those cases, we've written a fact sheet for free that summarizes the findings and you can look at that. Um, but yes, peer reviewed, yes. And then he was Over asking about second. replication. Oh, so our protocol is very, uh, it, it, it requires a lot of experimenters, a lot of time, it's very difficult. Um, and so it doesn't get replicated like we would hope it did. There's a group in Italy that's currently working on um, a, a protocol similar to ours. Um, but it does, it's right, again, because scientists need to eat and sleep indoors, there's no money for things like this. So not a lot of people are doing it. What would be the um, the impetus for someone to, to adopt this, to try and replicate this stuff? It's, it's, it's career suicide. There's no money. You're going to get ridiculed. So yeah, that um, replication is the cornerstone of science, but in the real world, it's really difficult. But our protocols are all um, out there. And, uh, people can read it and do it whenever they want, but it's really hard. It requires at least three experimenters, and it's very time consuming. You have to vet the sitter, you have to vet the medium. And so, no, it's, it's, it's not easy to do. Okay. But we hope more people do it. So if people got inspired by this interview to actually get a reading with a medium themselves, what advice would you give them? Um, so on our website is a, in the education uh, page, there's also a segment called fact sheets. And we have a fact sheet and it's advice for sitters. And so people can look at that. But um, basically you want to sort of engage in a, in a conversation uh, with your deceased person. You don't have to say it out loud. It can be in your head, that sort of thing. But I'd like to communicate with you and I'm thinking about getting a mediumship reading. Please help me pick the one that you want to talk to. And then if you, um, you know, you have a friend who got a good reading and they tell you, they spontaneously tell you after you have that conversation, hey, I got a mediumship reading from this person. Maybe that's the person you go to. Uh, we have a list of the, the, the Winbridge mediums on our website. And so, if you're going to use that, we suggest like you look through, they, they have the links to their website. So maybe you go through the websites and one will speak to you. Go, oh, okay, this one I like. I like me and my deceased person like this one. And that you do that. And then um, I think leave your expectations at the door. 
um, leave your assumptions because that can really ruin uh, a mediumship reading. So the medium doesn't have any control over who comes through or what they say. They're just a translator. So be open to the right stuff is going to come through. You don't have any control over who's going to talk or what they're going to say. And just be in the present and accept that for what it is. But again, this fact sheet has some more do's and don'ts. Sure. Okay, so I'll be linking to your website and to your books and all that. And people can find that page on batgap.com and uh, just hop from those links to your site and your books and so on. So thanks so much, Julie. I know this is a bit difficult for you because of the autoimmune condition you mentioned, and I really appreciate your spending this much time. I hope it wasn't too much of a strain or anything. I've really had a lot of fun talking to you and also preparing for this. I've had fun too. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I think this was, I'm, I'm just about um, at my end of my energy. <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs> well, we'll, I think we're good. good we'll wrap it up stop. before you fall off your chair. Uh, <laughs> so thanks to those who've been listening or watching. I really appreciate you being here. And uh, next week will be a physicist named Peter Russell who's written a book about sort of effortlessness and naturalness in and, and, and meditative practice. Um, and uh, go to batgap.com and explore the menus and see what you find. Thank you. I should have mentioned, I encourage people to join our um, email list to be notified of when we have new papers and that sort of thing. So if there, I should have said that. I'm sorry. So no, we'll leave that in. That... We'll leave that in right now. What you're oh, saying okay. right now, we'll just continue this thing. Okay. Yeah. I encourage people to sign up for our email list, which you can do on our website at winbridge.org to be notified whenever we um, have a new fact sheet or new free materials. We, uh, we Let people send know. that out to our email list and uh, we only send emails out about once a month. Great. All right. Well, thanks for everything you're doing, and, and take care, and maybe I'll run into you one of these days at some conference or something. <laughs> thanks so much for having me. It was a blast. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And hi to, hi to Mark, and hi to the dogs. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>